Hello, everyone, and welcome to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast, brought to you, as always, by the GSMC Sports Network. My name is Christopher Shepard. Today, we should have a great show ahead. Thank you yet again for tuning in. I appreciate all the support you guys are giving me right now. Like I said, we should have a great show again today. We are previewing and going over betting odds for both finals games in the NBA and in hockey with the Stanley Cup Finals. Then we are going to look into kind of another interesting series of segments where I'm going to be dissecting why both of our leaders in these finals, namely the Celtics and the Panthers, are such confusing fantasy teams due to the fact they are such well-built teams and structured around a system rather than one superstar player. And then stick around for the end of the show where the Euros will make their triumphant return and for the first time ever I'll be previewing one specific team in terms of their fantasy implications and that will be England. We will continue this series as the week goes along and as the Euros start up on Friday. But before we get into any of that, I do want to remind you guys yet again to please like, follow, and subscribe to the show if you are so willing. Also, if you do feel so inclined, we do receive a lot of tips and donations, so do consider leaving them at the link gsmc.cloud. It is a huge support to both me, my fellow podcasters, and especially the network, so anything you give is greatly appreciated. Also, if you're curious about something I said this episode and you want to leave a question, I will answer that at the beginning of next episode, so consider that if you will. Without further ado, let's get into another very exciting show. We begin, as we always do, with a little bit of basketball talk. We have to. It's the NBA Finals. Everyone is hyped. And this seems like a very pivotal kind of game three in terms of both fantasy odds and what it means for both teams as they head into this kind of stretch of the series where things can change in an instant or the Celtics can take advantage. Obviously, they lead 2-0 right now. But in this Game 3, anything can happen. Let's just go over the money lines and the betting odds for this game because I think they're really interesting. For the first time in this series, Dallas is favored in a game as the series shifts back to them. They are favored by 1.5 points. The over-under kind of low for this game as it has not necessarily been in the past two. At 212.5 points. And as we look at the money lines, Boston is plus 105. Dallas minus 125. So kind of a weird money line there where... It certainly favors Dallas, but not by as many as people think. However, I do think that this is a very pivotal uh, game, both for fantasy and for Dallas in real life, like I said. So let's look into the fantasy implications for this game and how much these players will be sending you back in your daily fantasy basketball squad. Luka remains the king of fantasy basketball and this series costing you a pretty penny as always 13.8k on DraftKings projected to have a whopping 62.8 fantasy points and interestingly enough the top fantasy prospect for the Celtics is Jason Tatum very scrutinized like we said on this show but he continues to over exceed expectations he's sitting at 11.6k in terms of budget on DraftKings and he's projected to have 51.5 fantasy points a player who certainly benefited from his performances in this series. Drew Holiday is sitting at 7K, a little bit pricier than maybe he was coming into the series, and is projected to have 33.8 DraftKings fantasy points. And here's a guy from the Mavs who I really think can get going, especially if we're going to talk about this a little later in the segment, a certain player from the Celtics is out, and that is Derek Lively the second. He's projected to have 18.3 fantasy points, but in the past two games, he has not cracked double digits at all. And that brings us into kind of the game plans for both of these teams. Obviously, I really think the Mavs, if they're going to win any game, it is this game. They have the home courts of advantage right now. They want to look to take one, if not two, of these games Make it a little bit tougher on the Celtics, especially now that, like I said, Chris Stapps, Porzingis is now day-to-day. Obviously, he wants to play. He's dying to play out there, literally saying that. But it sounds like Joe Mazzula saying it's a very serious, weird injury that they're going to have to monitor, and it's not up to Chris Stapps whether or not he's going to play. So 
it is definitely up in the air, much like he was for the entirety of the playoffs. So, that kind of changes things for Dallas because, like I said, the reason I'm picking Derek Lively is because of Porzingis' health. If Porzingis is not healthy or not fully fit for this game, expect Luka and Derek Lively's lob game to come back. That has been something that the Celtics have been able to shut down ever since Chris Porzingis was reintegrated into the team in the NBA Finals because of the fact of his height and length being an issue for these young, up-and-coming Dallas defenders. I said the fact that Kristaps Porzingis coming back would offer a nice little intriguing matchup, but Kristaps ultimately has dominated it to the point where Derek Lively has not been a prominent fantasy player you guys can rely on in your daily fantasy basketball squad. So, should Kristaps Porzingis not be healthy or sit out for this entirety of the game, Derek Lively, I expect, will be a lob game because let's think about how Dallas is set up for this series. They have um, kind of been going through Luka a lot more than usual, obviously, that they always do, but Luka has been the one trying to bring the ball up to court and ultimately has not been to any avail because the Celtics have stayed the course, sticking with their perimeter shooters, shutting down what has led Dallas at this point, and that is the corner three. But right now, Luka Doncic as a distributor can kind of integrate Dan Gafford and Derek Lively a little bit more into this Dallas offense, whereas that kind of lane was shut down by KP's emergence. And so I truly expect my bold prediction is going to be that Dallas will struggle with the corner threes yet again due to the fact that Joe Mazzulli is not going to strain away from what has helped the Celtics defensively in this series. But I think that opens up the passing lane for Luka Doncic and Dan Gaffin and Derek Lively. Now, notice how I did not mention Kyrie. I think Kyrie's struggles extend to this kind of disbelief in himself and mainly his head not being in it right now. I think that this is a much more mental issue for Kyrie than it is anything physical. I think he definitely has the capabilities to have a breakout game. I hope I'm proven wrong because Kyrie Irving has just been such a dazzling player for so many years in this league. And I wish him the best at what he does. But right now, I don't think Kyrie Irving just looks right or feels right in the slightest. I think that he's kind of in this muddled mindset where I know he's saying that the Boston crowd didn't necessarily affect him as much as he thinks it did. But it certainly is kind of emblematic of his divorce, this shaky divorce from the Boston Celtics organization. So... Kyrie in this game is certainly going to be someone to watch due to the fact that maybe the, him being back in Dallas can bolster his spirits and help him play a little bit better. But still, Kyrie Irving, I think there's something mightily wrong with the way he's playing. But looking at kind of the Celtics players who I think are going to step up, obviously no one truly knows who's going to be the best Celtics fantasy player. We'll discuss that in a later segment. But I do still think that Jason Tatum, obviously you can kind of put him down for not being the player you want him to be in a final series, but he's still very uh, impactful in the way they play as a contributor, as a facilitator. He doesn't necessarily have to put up points if he's dishing out assists to Boston's more role player kind of players. And so Jason Tatum... Being selfless, yes, you kind of don't want him to be if you're a fantasy player, but in terms of fantasy, assists and rebounds are still integral parts of how you score points. And so you can't necessarily rid yourself of that fact as much as you want to kind of get behind this whole mindset of, oh, I hate Jason Tatum because he just doesn't produce. He does produce, but in ways you might not necessarily expect from him, and he's been doing it to a T in this finals. And then speaking of Drew Holiday, Drew Holiday is such a very weird player because last game in game two, his scoring output was so unexpected because he's not known as a scoring point guard. He's known as a guy you kind of 
use his space to open up other shots for other players. And he's mainly more of a facilitator slash defensive stud who kind of does it on both ends of the floors, not by scoring points. But last game really kind of elevated his status as a fantasy player. So should you want a point guard, obviously what with Kyrie Irving struggling, who is not going to score as many points like a, like a person like JT would, but is still one of the better defensive fantasy players combined with his offensive prowess in terms of assist rate, then Drew Holiday's your pick. And then, it's extending down the lineup, obviously, if KP plays, that's a huge factor in real life and in fantasy as well. I think he adds value with the blocks and defensive solidity he brings. But still, he's definitely a player up in the air. I don't think it's his decision to make for this game. So we'll have to see with that. And then ultimately, guys like Derek White's going to step up defensively. Jalen Brown is obviously the heartbeat, the fulcrum of what makes the Celtics tick. So who knows? I, I really can't tell you who I think or will be the best Celtics fantasy basketball player tonight. But just know that it could be anyone. That's all I can say. And with that, that will just about do it for this segment. Coming up, like always, it's just this kind of week as we get into this final spirit. We switch from basketball to hockey, where I will obviously be previewing and going over the betting odds for the Panthers-Oilers game coming up tomorrow night. It's a can't-miss segment, as always, because I love talking hockey with you guys. We'll be right back with that. Should be a very good one. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign. A sign. I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign A sign I wanna be the greatest Everybody on their face shit I look around and feel like everybody is the fakest I make this every day and I'm impatient Hoping one day I blow up from the basement Statement, the top is so vacant I don't hear shit that I think is amazing Waiting for my day when I'm playing Sold out shows for a thousand faces Hey, give me that crown Get in my way and you'll be put down It ain't your place, all this my town If I want that shit, then I'll get it right now I'm losing it, the noose it fits Some loose shit, a stupid myth You choose to live or choose to dip You choose to fight or lose your grip And lose a gift, oh I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign A sign I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. I do hope you enjoyed that kind of preview of Game 3 of the NBA Finals coming up tonight. But we are going to transition to the Stanley Cup Finals game taking place tomorrow night between the Florida Panthers and Edmonton Oilers. Before we do, I want to remind you yet again to consider leaving a tip or donation at the link gsmc.cloud to support the network. Me and my fellow podcasters' questions are also welcome, and they will be answered at the beginning of the next episode, so do consider that. Coming up now for our second segment of today's show... We are transitioning, as always, in this kind of heavy finals period from basketball to hockey, where Game 3 of the Florida Panthers and Edmonton Oilers Stanley Cup Final Series will take place tomorrow night. Now, let's just go over the money line and the kind of over-under in terms of points as the series shifts to Edmonton. So does this kind of money line. We look at the money line for this game, and it says Edmonton minus 125 and Florida plus 115. The total points for this game is 5.5. Kind of always sits in that range for any playoff hockey game because of the fact that no one knows if offense or defense will win the day in any given night. Let's switch over to fantasy. And in terms of the Florida Panthers, it always starts and ends with the man in that, Sergei Bobrovsky. 10K for a goalkeeper. The most expensive player for the Florida Panthers is a goalkeeper. We're going to get into why the Flo- that is kind of when we go into my next segment about the Florida Panthers and their whole fantasy story. 10K. 13.4 DraftKings fantasy points projected for Sergei Bobrovsky tomorrow night. 
And then I kind of wanted to highlight this guy like I did in previous episodes this week because of the fact he's kind of coming on as this series progresses. He necessarily was not as good in other playoff series. Evan Rodriguez, their second line winger, 5.6K. He's still not in that range where his price is inflating in fantasy, so take him while he is still lower valued. 7.6K. 7.6 DraftKings fantasy points in terms of him. Evan Rodriguez is a player to watch in this final series. One of the most exciting players to watch in this series, in my honest opinion, because of the fact he has been scoring in bunches, three goals in two games. I'm excited to see what he does in this one. Moving over to the Edmonton Oilers. I really can't say I'm confident in picking an Edmonton Oiler right now in this series, but should you feel so inclined, Connor McDavid is going to have to be the guy to get the Edmonton Oilers engine running. 11K valuation. He is projected to have 15.1 DraftKings fantasy points tomorrow night, so they are expecting him as the series shifts back to Rogers' place in Edmonton, but David to step up his game. But if you want a guy who I'm really high on as kind of a fantasy wild card because of the fact he constantly gets rotated in and out of the squad, but still can add huge, tremendous value to an Edmonton Oilers defense who is currently looking for answers as to how to maintain that defensive mindset and solidity, both in their penalty kill and at even strength. Look at Ryan McLeod. 3.4K valuation, very low for a defenseman, even though he is a defenseman, and only 36 DraftKings fantasy points. Now, obviously this is a risk because, as we all know, Chris Knobloch is always experimenting with the defense, and that is one of the keys to how Edmonton can get back in this series. Which defenseman makes Stuart Skinner more comfortable? As we saw in the Dallas Stars Conference Final Series, Ryan McLeod was a huge game-changer in that regard. Really helped Stuart Skinner get the Oilers back into the series. And so... Should Ryan McLeod play tomorrow, look for him to have a fantastic game because of the fact he seems to be one of those defenders that can just come in and really say, hey guys, I know we're struggling, but let's keep it together and maybe we'll get something out of this game. And that just needs to be the mindset for the Edmonton Oilers as a whole as the series shifts back to their hometown. The Rodgers place will obviously be hopping. It's been a fantastic playoff atmosphere for all these years of the Edmonton Oilers trying to get back into that contention status. And so, look for this hometown crowd to kind of carry Edmonton through. I still think Florida is just too dangerous. They might steal a game at home. I do think Edmonton will win a game at home in this series. They're going to have to now as they want to get back into the series. So, they will definitely do that in my personal opinion, but the Florida Panthers are just too good to not at least split those two away games. But this game just feels like a game where Chris Knobloch needs to get his choices right. I feel like Edmonton has the potential to finally break through against Sergei Bobrovsky, solve the unsolvable, but it just needs to come from Chris Knobloch getting his rotation right, understanding how to set up not just in terms of Oilers' strength, but also their weaknesses. Because right now, the Oilers' weaknesses are the most prevalent thing about them in the series. They are not fantastic at even strength right now. And Stuart Skinner does not necessarily feel confident in his defensemen at even strength. So we'll have to see how Driss Knobloch experiments and puts out a team that he truly believes can steal some of these games at home in the series. But I do think this series is very interesting fantasy-wise, mainly due to the fact that Sergei Bobrovsky has just been getting so much attention at the goaltender spot in fantasy. You don't necessarily see it that often that a goalie all of a sudden surges so high up the fantasy rankings. As we're going to discuss tomorrow in another segment where I go over the betting odds for Con Smythe MVP awards for this Stanley Cup playoff run, I do think that Sergei Bobrovsky's status has truly been elevated and it's a sight to behold. 
on the Edmonton Oilers side of things, I'm surprised that Connor McDavid is rated as highly as he is right now because of the fact that, yes, he does have an assist in this series. He finally broke the duck in terms of points in the uh, Stanley Cup Finals. Only goal and assist in the Stanley Cup Finals thus far for Edmonton, and that's going to have to change. But right now, Connor McDavid, his, his uh, kind of run is cooled down considerably. And going back home, he definitely needs a, a game where he kind of settles down. And ultimately, this whole Edmonton Oilers offensive mindset is entirely up to him. He is the guy who has the pace and electricity to confuse and confound the Florida Panthers defense. But his teammates need to elevate around him as well. He needs to find a way to get his teammates, his line mates, to step up to his level. Because right now... All I'm seeing at even strength for the Edmonton Oilers is Connor McDavid entering the zone at pace and no one following up to kind of crash the glass, kind of get more active in the forecheck, on the rush, what have you, to kind of help Connor McDavid. Because right now, he just looks like a, 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 a headless chicken running around. He just looks kind of lost. He doesn't know who to rely on because of the fact that the Florida Panthers cover everything so well in front of Bobrovsky, and then there's Bobrovsky, who's been impossible to get beyond. So that's going to have to be one of the areas where Edmonton steps up, how they revolve around Connor McDavid when they are in the Florida Panthers' defensive zone. For the Florida Panthers' end, just keep doing what you're doing, man. I know it's cliche to say. I've said it all week, but just keep doing what you're doing. Obviously, you know, in Game 1, they kind of stole that game away from Edmonton. Edmonton really could have won that game if their scoring boots were on. But ultimately, the Florida Panthers just have so much depth. and I'm, I'm really going to try and dissect it in a couple segments from now. But still, the Florida Panthers, this looks like they're serious to lose right now. And they really have the opportunity to stick their uh, neck and throat Again, in this case, in this series, because of the fact that they have the goalie, they have the defense, and they have just enough offensive juice to carry them over the line. Ultimately, they want to do it to kind of avenge last season's loss. They just have so much spirit. That's another thing. They just have so much spirit. You can see it with so many of their fantasy players stepping up. Rodriguez was not a factor in my mind in this series in the slightest. And he has become one of the be their best fantasy players, and a guy who I would immediately want to steal, while the, he is still kind of in this cheaper range. And so, ultimately, if you're the Florida Panthers, you gotta like where you're at right now. Obviously, the Edmonton Oilers' home ice advantage is a very, very, very scary uh, arena to enter in you to. But the Florida Panthers, if any team can do it, it's them. I'm really, really intrigued to see how this plays out. Can Edmonton Stars get it going? Or can the Florida Panthers team continue staying within their system, staying within their selves, elevating each other beyond what they know they can be? Obviously, the Barkov injury is a bit scary to me, but ultimately I think they have enough to kind of cover for him. He is kind of one of the vital part pieces of this team, but they just have so much depth, so I'm not necessarily too worried about them kind of not getting any more offensive production than they already are. But still, if you're Florida, keep doing what you're doing. If you're Edmonton, you got to find a way to get your offensive juice back. But that should just about do it for this segment. Coming up next, like I said before, I'm going to be looking at these two leaders of these respective finals in both the Boston Celtics and the Florida Panthers and kind of their fantasy stories. What makes them so weird in the way that they don't necessarily have one true superstar in terms of fantasy and then also kind of dissect how people you as a, a fantasy playing public kind of view them as players in your squad so it should be kind of these two int intriguing segments that i'm really excited to present to you guys we'll be right back with those they should be fantastic Looking for your daily fix of sports talk without having to pay for it? GSMC Sports Network is available on YouTube. Just search GSMC Sports Network. Get your fix of daily sports talk shows on YouTube absolutely free. 
NFL, college football, NBA, MLB, MMA, UFC, fantasy football, and so much more. GSMC Sports Network has shows running all day long with new sports shows starting every two hours. Just like on your favorite cable sports channel, except GSMC Sports Network is absolutely free. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. Now for these next two segments, this is going to be an interesting deep dive into how two teams and their fantasy stories kind of combine to create this confounding conundrum that can't be solved by many. So let's just start off with these two teams. They're the leaders in their respective finals, namely the Boston Celtics and the Florida Panthers. We will start off with the Boston Celtics. They are truly one of these teams that don't have a superstar like a Luka Doncic or a Nikola Jokic or even a Victor Wembanyama who can step up in terms of fantasy and be someone who is highly coveted on fantasy markets. And I think that kudos has to go to both of these GMs, namely Brad Stevens and Bill Zito, for kind of ignoring how people view fantasy sports and saying, hey, we want to build a team game in real life. And for people who view fantasy, it's up to them to want to pick players who might not value points over helping their team to an ultimate goal. And so I kind of admire that even though for you guys, it's just been kind of confusing because, like, who am I going to pick if I want a Boston Celtic or Florida Panther on my team? So without further ado, let's jump right into the Boston Celtics because they are the more confusing team due to the fact that their players are just scattered all over the top 100 list. This is mainly based on the top 100 fantasy uh players in both respective sports. I took the top five players from both teams and kind of dissected their whole fantasy story, their whole spiels. And so let's jump right into the Celtics. Obviously, Jason Tatum is your number one overall player, but he isn't even in the top 10. He's 14th overall as the overall fantasy player rankings go. And then in your number two spot, he's kind of a surprising player, but I'm not necessarily... That surprise, due to the fact that he is a big man and big men are more valued in fantasy. Kristaps Porzingis is 15th overall for the Celtics. And then you have to go down a ways to find their next player in the top 100 with Derek White at 37th overall. That's kind of interesting that Derek White is that high because of the fact he is viewed more of a defensive-minded kind of guard player rather than someone who can add offense. But still, I can see why people might covet Derek White. And then you have to go even lower to find Shu Holiday at 66 overall. And JB rounds out their top five players in the top 100 at 67th. Now here's why this Celtics team is so befuddling in terms of fantasy. If you look at these kind of three important fantasy stats where you have usage rate, their player efficiency rating, and turnover margin, it really tells a very wild story of who the Celtics are as a team and as fantasy players. Let's start off with Jason Tatum. Surprisingly, Jason Tatum, no matter how scrutinized he is, is 16th in terms of usage rate in fantasy. That means people really, really think that Jason Tatum can help their team. They're using him a lot. Obviously not a top 10, top 5 production, but still that's pretty high for a player of Jason Tatum's caliber. But here's another interesting stat. In terms of turnover percentage, he is 261st. That is a fantastic thing to be. I think that Jason Tatum is one of those players who you really want to take a flyer on due to the fact that he can put up points. People know he can put up points, but is still one of those guys who's going to butt, people are going to butt heads over, debate about a lot, toss and turn their sleep at night because of the fact that Jason Tatum can really help you or he can really kind of be one of those players who stagnates in terms of points but then elevates the rest of his game we're seeing it in the nba finals as an example but still jason tatum being in there it's not necessarily as surprising to me because he still is a big name kp on the other hand no matter being the 15th overall fantasy player right now he tells the story of who the Boston Celtics are and what people view of them. 
only 56th in usage rate, even though he is one of the better fantasy players overall. Obviously, he did not play as much. They wanted to rotate him in and out of their lineup. And that kind of show goes to show that he is very injury-prone and people might be a little worried about him. On the whole, as one of those players who you can't necessarily trust all the time to start or put on your bench as a utility player. So that kind of makes a little bit of sense, but still, for a player of his caliber and his status in the, in the fantasy realm, it's kind of weird. He's still... 15th in player efficiency rating so that's very high for him so you can see these kind of weird conflated stats between how these boston celtics really play they have they're very high up in certain categories very low down in other categories and the same rings true for a player in Derek white who's one of probably one of the most intriguing players in the boston celtics in terms of fantasy 105th in terms of player efficiency rating 156th, 165th rather, in terms of usage rate, and 229th in terms of uh, kind of one of those players who is the middle ground for the Celtics. Not necessarily high on anything, very low in things, but still kind of you can see the mismatched balance in some of those rankings for him. And then Drew Holiday, obviously not necessarily the best of fantasy players in the regular season, it's not necessarily the case in the postseason, as we've seen in the NBA Finals, really elevating his game in terms of point production and maintaining his defensive solidity, as always. But he's only 172nd in player efficiency rating, 256th in usage rate, which is kind of surprising, and 80th in turnover percentage. So you, uh, still another player whose stats are very mismatched, very idiosyncratic player there. And then finally, JB is 56th in usage rate, 25th in player efficiency rating, and 240th. So that's also very weird. But the fact that your last player, in terms of overall fantasy rankings, is more valued than, say, a Jason Tatum. That, and that is the conundrum people have to solve out the Celtics. Do you want a player who is more coveted in the fantasy realm, who stats and pundits say are better at what they do in terms of fantasy or do you want a guy who's used less not necessarily viewed as a sexy fantasy pick but still in almost every stat is very even and that kind of shows the difference between Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown I think Jason Tatum is over hated and I think that Jalen Brown is underrated meaning that Jason Tatum he is one of those players who's obviously going to stir controversy because even though people want to call him a superstar, they can't because of the fact in these clutch situations, he's not necessarily doing what superstars often do. Whereas Jalen Brown, in terms of fantasy, he is viewed lesser than, but he's still one of the best players on the court for the Boston Celtics at any given time. And that's reflected in how people view him in fantasy. So, the question is, do you want a player who is, in many people's minds, just on the precipice of superstardom and just needs kind of, a whether it be a championship or an MVP to elevate him to that status and kind of be viewed differently, to be one of those fantasy players who you have to kind of put up with, or... Do you want a guy who's being completely underestimated in terms of fantasy, but in terms of his usage rate and other stats, it's very high up on these lists. And so the Boston Celtics as a whole just are really, really spaced out on the spectrum here. You have guys who are their top who are more the top end of the overall fantasy list who are very low in certain stats and then guys who are very low down in the fantasy list like Jalen Brown who are still very valued. And I think that more has to do with how Boston Celtics play in the playoffs more than it has to do with what they did in the regular season. I think these stats are a bit inflated for playoffs, obviously not yet for Drew Holiday mainly because of the fact he's not necessarily in the regular season that highly coveted at all because of the fact the point there are better point guards out there. And so I just feel like 
the question of the Boston Celtics is, do you take balance over risk? Do you take a player who you're is gonna you're gonna sacrifice kind of your your point stats for someone who is willing to be a system player? Are you going to take someone who's not valued in the fantasy realm but people use a lot? That's kind of the question for me with the Boston Celtics. But that will just about do it for this segment of today's show. Coming up next, we transition from the Boston Celtics to the Florida Panthers who are one of the most well-oiled fantasy machines in all of sports due to the fact that their team is just so well-built. We'll be right back with that segment. I really enjoy these two segments for you guys. I'm really excited to present this information because to me it's quite interesting to kind of dissect these teams. But we will be right back with the Florida Panthers deep dive right away. For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows, available everywhere podcasts are found. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. We are going to continue with the theme of dissecting teams in terms of fantasy. We're going to transition from basketball to hockey. Obviously, the Boston Celtics are leading in the NBA Finals, and so too are the Florida Panthers in the Stanley Cup Finals. And let's just do a deep dive on them. They are also a very weird team when it comes to fantasy. However, I do feel like in fantasy hockey, Points are more viewed highly of at a premium than in the NBA where different stats are so confusing and confounding in terms of how to truly rate a player. And so in fantasy hockey, goals, points, and assists are more valued than, say, how you're going to use a player in your fantasy squad. So this one is much more valued than, I would say, an NBA deep dive is. But I still think that dissecting both of these teams is highly important if you want to understand them better. And in the future, you want to draft players from them as well. So without further ado, let's look at a Florida Panthers squad that has had so many different contributions throughout the years. Kudos to GM Bill Zito for building a squad that is so unselfish in terms of how they play. But still, as you can see with the list I'm going to name for them, they do have guys who have been stars in this league. So let's go... Again, same thing with uh, the Florida Panthers like I did for the Boston Celtics. Just looking at the top five players in the top 100 of overall fantasy hockey players this time. And so without further ado, let's get right into it. Their number one player, a guy who I truly love as a fantasy player. Sam Reinhardt, again, only 14th in terms of overall fantasy playing. But the stats don't tell us that story. The underlying stats are truly incredible for him. He was second in the league in goals. Sam Reinhart, a player who I think is truly underrated, is second in the league in goals. That's an impressive prospect, but only 14th in overall fantasy rating. So that's kind of low for someone of Sam Reinhart's abilities. And it might have to do with the fact he's a Florida Panther, but still 86th in assists kind of goes against him. But overall, he was still 12th in points. That just goes to show the fact that Maybe it's the aura of the Florida Panthers as a whole team that Sam Reinhardt has put up those stats. 12th in the league in points, but only 14th in overall fantasy rating. In my mind's eye, he's a star of the league. Just such a dominant player, a strong physical center who can get the job done on both ends of the ice. And really, I just think it's just this enigmatic kind of mindset that people have around the Florida Panthers that might put them off the Florida Panthers bandwagon when picking their fantasy squad. But coming in at number 15 on the list and number 2 in overall Panthers in the top 5 of the top 100 is Matthew Kachuk at 15th. This time around, I kind of don't know why he's as high. So again, another player who is very high in the rankings, but their stats don't necessarily prove that they're a good fantasy player. 74th in terms of goals, 
12th though in terms of assists, so as you can see, they're kind of switcherooing between who is leading in goals and who is leading in the Swiss, Sam Reinhardt and Matthew Kachuk. Overall, 28th in points though, only 8 behind teammate Sam Reinhardt. So as you can see, another player who, in terms of fantasy, the stats don't tell the whole story of who they are as a player, and maybe the team doesn't either. But coming in at number 3, obviously, in terms of fantasy basketball, you can't necessarily say this about any other position in sports. Goalies are very important, and nonetheless, and no one has been more important for their team than Sergei Bobrovsky in terms of fantasy and in real life. Only 26th overall in fantasy. That's really saying something. I think that's very high for a goalie, but he definitely deserves it. Ninth in save percentage, obviously. As the playoffs go on, he's definitely heightened that statistic. Only 60th in goals against average. Didn't necessarily have the best of regular seasons. But he was third in wins. So another player who had a fantastic season. One of the best goalies to have in fantasy hockey in real life. Sergio Bobrovsky between the sticks. Incredible in the postseason. Probably the best postseason fantasy goalie. But again, in the regular season, I don't know what it is about the Florida Panthers. They are proving that... Rather, much like the Celtics, but unlike the Celtics, they have players who are higher ranked and they definitely have the stats to back it up, but still are very low in terms of overall fantasy rankings. Then you have a guy, Alexander Barkov, who's 44th in overall fantasy rankings, who definitely can be viewed as the star of this team, one of the captains of this squad. However, his stats are definitely not reflective of anyone in the top 50 of overall fantasy hockey players. Only 98th in goals. He is 20th in assists and 27th in points. Now this is a guy who I'm really weird about in terms of fantasy. Because when he's on, he's on. He can produce in terms of assists. One of the best kind of centers in this Panther system. Probably the best Panther center if you want to go by Aura alone. But still, I think that Alexander Barkov is one of the more overrated players in terms of fantasy, and that's why he's so low in the fantasy rankings. However, in terms of stats, only seven behind Matthew Kachuk in terms of points. So this is kind of one of those players who you kind of are not necessarily taking a flyer on. You know is going to be one of those players who can produce for you, but still might not tell the whole story and how people view him in fantasy. And their last player, kind of this cluster here, Verhage at 49th. And he's probably one of the most even in terms of stats out of all the Panthers. 23rd in goals, 28th in assists, and 45th in points. So as you can see, one of the most steady in all stat lines. He's very similar standing in all three of those stats there. So the Florida Panthers, in my mind's eye, are one of those teams who, when we look at them, they definitely have more players who are higher up in the list. They're not as spread out as the Boston Celtics were. And they're definitely producing the stats to back them up in real time. So the question with the Florida Panthers is, why are they so kind of close together when in fact they are some of the better fantasy players in here? And that's the reason why I think that there really is no rhyme or reason to the Florida Panthers right now as a fantasy squad. They certainly have the best players in the NHL. There's no question about that. Maybe it's due to the fact that a lot of people view them as equals rather than one being better than the other. Take Sam Reinhardt, for example. Sam Reinhardt, in my opinion, is probably the second best player on this Florida Panthers squad on his day. I'll take Alexander Barkov, mainly just due to name and brand and aura alone, what have you. But Sam Reinhardt, in my opinion, second in terms of overall production. First in my mind, if we get rid of aura and name and brand. In terms of overall fantasy, being 14th, I know that's not necessarily the worst, but I think Sam Reinhardt, based off the stat, second in goals, 12th in points. Sam Reinhardt, for all intents and purposes, should be a top five fantasy player in my mind's eye he's a no-brainer in your squad if you want goals not necessarily assists maybe that's what hurts him ultimately but 12th in points is still outstanding however i think that due to the fact that the florida panthers just have so many players in the top 100 who are so close together maybe that's why sam reinhardt who i view so highly is 
is not necessarily viewed as highly in fantasy. Then take a guy like Alexander Barkov, who a lot of people know about, is only 44th, and this year mainly could be one of the reasons why. He obviously was not high in goals. He was 20th in assists, only 27 in points, only 7 behind Matthew Kachuk, who is their second-rated fantasy player on this list. So, it just goes to show that the discrepancies in the Florida Panthers squad might lay within the fact that people aren't necessarily uncomfortable picking with them. It's just a matter of there being too many of them to decide between. Maybe it's just because of the fact that this season for the Florida Panthers, because of their depth, so many different players were able to step up for them. Sam Reinhardt being one of them. And I think so many people now really are going to start to come around to the Florida Panthers. Next year, I think that even more Florida Panthers are going to be in the top 100. Now they're getting the uh, name brand that they truly deserve. I think that should they win their first Stanley Cup final in franchise history, the duck will be broken. People won't be necessarily shying away from them. And I think that maybe one or even two of them will break into the top five in terms of fantasy, Sam Reinhart will get a lot more respect because right now, this Florida Panthers team, no matter how much closer they are together than the Boston Celtics were to spread all across the map, I still don't think they're as highly valued as people want them to be. I certainly think the Florida Panthers players should be put at a premium when you view fantasy. Florida Panthers players should always be on your radar no matter what. They're not sleeper picks anymore in my opinion. These are bona fide fantasy stars. So for next season, I'll be really intrigued to see if more players from this loaded Panther squad break into the top 15, top 20 at the very least. Because I just don't think this team is reflected in how well they play in fantasy and in the stats that I see on paper. Whereas the Boston Celtics, obviously, I just think there's so many different players or across this list that you have to kind of spread them across the map in terms of fantasy. But these two teams, they were very nice to talk about due to the fact that they were kind of similar, but then also kind of drastically different in their own in their own ways. There are a lot of diversity within how we view them in fantasy. So it was very nice to talk about these two teams. But coming up next should be a fantastic segment. The Euros make their triumphant return. As for the first time ever in the history of the show, I'll be reviewing a team in terms of their fantasy implications for the Euros, and it should be a good one. It is England, the three lions on a shirt, who I'll be previewing first for my Euros fantasy previews. You do not want to miss this segment. Should be an absolute cracker. We will be right back to end the show with that. Stick around, please. Hello everyone and welcome back for the final segment of today's edition of the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast and it should be a fantastic one. You guys have been loving the Euro segment so I thought why not have it make its triumphant return in the form of me reviewing a team in terms of fantasy implications who you should roster from this specific team for your Euros Fantasy Squad for the upcoming tournament. And I thought I would start off with one of the most talented squads top to bottom 
in the Euros this year, a team looking to break through after over 56 years of hurt. They never stop me dreaming. That is the England squad, the three Lions. I think that this team, in terms of fantasy, should be very exciting to discuss. And so without further ado, let's get right into it. Now, obviously, when you look at this England squad, you might be be having a hard time choosing who to roster just because of how fantastic each and every single player is. So I'm just going to go through position by position and see what happens and overall give my opinion on who I think is, is a good option and who I think maybe you should shy away from. So let's start at the very top with the world's best striker, Harry Kane. Now he's the most expensive striker. So I highly recommend that if you build from top to bottom your Euros fantasy squad, unlike a guy like me who wishes to build bottom to top and maybe save a little money for a big swing like Harry Kane, I do think you should take him immediately. I think he kind of fits more into a team built top to bottom. You'll be happy to throw your money at him, mainly because of the fact, A, he's their penalty taker. B, he can drop deep into the midfield and provide assists. C, he's just an all-around fantastic player that will really help this young England squad. He will benefit from the youth in this squad. I think that it will allow him to just focus on goal scoring. Obviously, he'll he'll take the penalties as well. He should have a boatload of penalties in this tournament. So Harry Kane is as good as gold at the striker position. Should you want to take a flyer on him as a more expensive option? Because he's worth it. Now, speaking of youth in this England squad. They have a dearth of it. They have a fantastic amount of, of youth in this squad. They have bucket loads of, of youth in this squad. And it all starts off with one of their most valued players in Jude Bellingham. Now, in my mind's eye, Jude Bellingham isn't necessarily going to help you in terms of goals and assists. I think he's a very creative player. And obviously, domestically at Real Madrid, he kind of proves that notion wrong in terms of goals and assists because he had a fantastic goal-scoring campaign. But I think his main job at the Euros is going to be A, to recover balls and B, progress the field of the pitch to guys on the wing where I expect most of England's production to come from. And that, for that reason, I think that Jude Bellingham might be valued a little bit more highly. I still love him. I still think that he is going to be one of the young stars to watch at this Euros. He's just growing and growing exponentially as the seasons go by. And so Jude Bellingham... While not a player I would want to take a flyer on in my own Euros Fantasy squad, I think can be an interesting sleeper pick if you want a guy who's more known for ball recoveries and a guy who can maybe stick a long-range goal into the back of the net on his day. But in terms of young midfielders who I think well, immediately I would want to slot into my squad. How about Phil Foden? He's a winger. He's a hybrid player. He is a midfielder who can drop centrally. Phil Foden had a fantastic domestic campaign at Man City. Over 21 goal involvements in a Man City kit. I think he's going to have an outstanding Euros. Wherever Gareth Southgate puts him, I think he will thrive in this squad. He's truly a star. He's rising before our eyes. I think that Phil Foden at $9 million, he's another one of those higher-priced players due to the fact that the England squad is just so much talent at so many different positions. But I would immediately, without, without any hesitation, put Phil Foden into my squad just because of the fact that A, he can assist, B, he's known for his long-range shots and they get you more points, and C, I just think that dropping centrally, he might have a couple of uh, long-range assists as well. Another player who I'm really interested in might not get as much playing time, but another guy to keep an eye out for in terms of penalties, Cole, Cole World Palmer. I think that Cole Palmer has had a fantastic season. Signing of the season, young player of the season in the Premier League as he moved from Man City to Chelsea. One of the reasons that Chelsea is in Europe right now, Cole Palmer, man. I think that obviously Gareth Southgate has such a fantastic a uh, winger uh, kind of depth that is his disposal. I think that Cole Palmer is just one of those players who is going to be integrated into the squad. So he might not be one of those guys in terms of minutes who you can constantly rely on. But at 7.5 million, one of the lower rate, r rated players in terms of price in this England squad. So if you want someone who can come off your bench, maybe, I can see Cole Palmer 
being that guy for you. I think he's going to have a nice little use, maybe score a penalty kick or two, and get to do the Cole World Celebration, one of the best in the game, in my humble opinion. One of the things that I really love about England, and you should really love about them, should you want to roster a lot of England players in your Euros Fantasy squad, is the fact that most of their goals, due to Gareth Southgate's system, comes through set pieces. England, when it comes to dead ball scenarios, free kicks, penalties, corners, are one of the best teams in the world. They thrive in those positions because of the fact they have so many creative wingers who can win fouls, get in the box. They are one of the teams to watch in the tournament if you are, want a lot of goals scored from those situations. Five of the last six English goals, both in qualifying and in friendlies, were from the ball, so look out for them. You always want to poach a goal or two for your Euros Fantasy squad, so be wary of that fact. However, let's transition from the, 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 the positives of this England squad and their attacking talent to the negatives of this England squad and their defensive questions. Now, I'm not saying their defensive players aren't fantastic. They have two of the best uh, defenders in their back line right now in Kyle Walker and John Stones if and when he's fit. But they really are the only two guys in their defense now with that experience. Obviously, Luke Shaw is also coming back from injury. And Harry Maguire was left out of the squad, surprisingly, due to the fact that he did not have a fantastic domestic campaign. And now only Kyle Walker and John Stones really have that veteran nous in that back line. And at five and a half million and five million, yes, they're very cheap, but I would shy away from the England defense. That being said, I do have Pickford in net. I do think Pickford might be one of those leaders for England to really help integrate newer defenders like Mark Gahey or Tyrick Mitchell or whoever Gareth Southgate decides to put in those positions. But really, I think that England are a team who has all the attacking talent in the world and might not now have the defensive solidity they once had. So I'm going to say that I'm going to sigh away from the England defense. A wild card, in my opinion, in terms of attacking uh, talents for England is Bukayo Saka. There are going to be a lot of questions about the England position, and a lot of people think that Bukayo Saka has that wing position down pat. I think he definitely had a fantastic domestic campaign at Arsenal, but still I think that right now Bukayo Saka, should Cole Palmer be viewed by Gareth Salke to be one of those players that he wants to give more minutes, I do think Bukayo Saka might fall by the wayside at 8.5 million. He is kind of one of the lower rated uh, offensive attackers in this England squad. But right now, Bukayo Saka is really a wild card due to the fact that Gareth Southgate might want more uh, youth on the wing and want more rotation as the knockout stages progress. And that's a big thing for England, the wing position. Which England winger, that's the question, that's the question in my mind. Which England winger do you want to rely on for your team? Foden, Saka, or Palmer? That is going to have to be answered. Ultimately, though, I think England is going to be one of the most exciting squads in terms of fantasy should they go deep in the tournament. They definitely have a very high ceiling. I think they can make it all the way to the finals. They have the players to win it. They have the attacking talent to win it. The question marks are still going to be in the defense, but I do have high hopes for this England squad. In terms of fantasy, they are going to be one of the most scrutinized because of the fact that any of their players in the in the midfield to their attack can produce. And so I'm going to be keeping my eye on them for quite some time. Look out for cheaper options off the bench for uh, Maybe Ollie Watkins gets a chance to shine at $7.5 million at the striker position. Who knows? We will have to see. But that will just about do it for this edition of the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast, brought to you, as always, by the GSMC Sports Network. My name has been Christopher Shepard. If you enjoyed this show, please do like, follow, and subscribe to it. Le consider leaving a tip or donation at the link gsmc.cloud. It is greatly appreciated by all at the network. Thank you guys for tuning in. Coming up tomorrow, we should have another fantastic show, sticking with the basketball and hockey theme, and also getting more into my Euros team previews with two teams, not just one this time around. Should be a can't-miss show. Thank you guys yet again for tuning in. Good night.
<laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Good morning. Okay, that was kind of a weird way to end the show, but overall, we're going to be back tomorrow, bigger and better than ever, with another fantastic show. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. That's me.